going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. On January 2nd, David Pepper was sworn in as Hamilton County Commissioner. In his campaigns for commissioner as well as for mayor the year earlier, Pepper focused on the need to address crime in the community. That was also a theme of his address at the swearing in. This simply cannot continue, and I think our collective responsibility with all the leadership in this room and those who couldn't be here is to make sure we put an end to it. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. When David Pepper, Pepper joined Todd Portoon and Pat DeWine on a three-person Hamilton County Commission at the beginning of the month, it marked the first time that two Democrats occupied commission seats at the same time in 40 years. That certainly says something about Mr. Pepper, but it also says something about the changing character of Hamilton County. Whether it is Congress or the County Commission, when a political party finds itself in the majority after years in the minority, it faces a responsibility to govern, not just participate as the loyal opposition. I am joined this morning by Hamilton County's newest commissioner, David Pepper. David, welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be Last here. Last time you were here was right after the election, um, and it was a, a good Sunday morning discussion about sort of the the character of campaigning, but now right. we're talking about governance. Absolutely. Um, let me ask this question just to begin with. You've been there for about three weeks. What's the most surprising thing that you've run into that maybe you weren't ready for, or didn't know about, weren't expecting? I can't say a, nothing's been too surprising. I think you obviously have many independent office holders of the county, and I th it's, it's not a surprise, but I think one of the challenges is to make sure that uh, you are all communicating well respecting each other's you know office and jurisdiction so I've taken a lot of time to to tour the recorder's office and to talk to you know Greg Hartman the clerk of courts to make sure you know you have all these different entities they all oversee a critical function in the county and they all have to figure out how to work together and you know it's a mix of Democrats and Republicans so I think it, it takes some time but also careful work to build those relationships and it's, it's I think worth reinforcing here that in the, at the county there are these offices, I think there are nine, mm -hmm. that are elected directly. Right. And they, at the city, it's city council and the mayor are elected directly, and then everybody else right. is an employee. That's not true in the county. Right. So the dynamics, the human dynamics are different. Right, and, and you know, whether it's Bob Gehring or, or, or Rebecca Grappi or Dusty Rhodes, these are people who've been there for a long time. They take a lot of pride in their work. They're very professional. And it's been, frankly, a pleasure getting to know all of them, and, and often, you know, party drops out of it and they're just people trying to do a good job and we're certainly there to, to help support that. So it's been actually a very positive experience meeting all these office holders and, and getting to know their shops. Let's talk about a couple of the issues that have come up. Crime uh, is obviously one of the developments that is really important and this week an announcement was made about collaborating between the county and the city on the question, the important question of the jail. Let's take a listen to something that was said. We're here today to announce that a majority of the city council support an effort for the city of Cincinnati to work in partnership and collaboration with our Hamilton County officials to help solve the problem of jail overcrowding in our community. Let's take two things here. Over the years, we're used to hearing good words on the steps of City Hall or the county courthouse about we're going to cooperate right. now. Is there really anything different about this? Should we take any more hope here? I think there is. I, mean, I think that that, that, that uh, press conference uh, actually re represents a lot of back and forth talking before and after. Uh, we, we all know each other very well, myself, these council members, the mayor, uh, Top Wartoon, Pat DeWine. So that uh, obviously I think I agree there have been a lot of press conferences with a lot of you know, high words, but I think the key is that we can actually roll up our sleeves and work together, and that's precisely what we're going to do. And, and the, the thing that I talked about throughout the campaign is crime is a regional issue, and the city's in charge of certain functions, and the county and all those different offices we talked about are in charge of other functions. And together, all those different functions can solve crime. None, none alone can do it. So if we're not working together, whether it's a jail issue or other issues around prevention or treatment or policing or communications, we're just not going to get the job done. One of the important pieces of what Jeff said there, what Jeff Birding said, was he talked about collaboration between the city and county officials. He didn't say county, just county commissioners. Right. I mean, obviously Sheriff Lease on this jail question is absolutely key and central to this. 
What's been the role of getting the sheriff on board to collaborate and work with this and that he can feel like something's going to happen. He's got real concerns Absolutely. here. He has something, has there been a breakthrough there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the key again is dialogue. I don't think anyone wants to be surprised when they read something in the paper they didn't know about. Uh, that's happened in the past. I think to, to their credit, Jeff Birding and others sat down with him. I talk with him uh, frequently, the sheriff that is, um, to make sure that we're on the same page. In the end, he, he's the jail person. He's right. the jail expert and you're not gonna build or operate anything that he doesn't think makes sense. I think it just wouldn't be responsible uh, to move forward. So, you know, in, in my, you know, discussions with the city councils, make sure that you are working with the sheriff on anything you announce. Uh, don't get out in front of him, um, work with him and make sure he's comfortable with it. And that is where we are. That's what's b behind that statement. Yeah. Sheriff Lease does feel like this is a process. But that's just the start. And I think as you discuss it further, uh, you have to keep that dialogue going. Um, there's, you know, there's so much history of, right. of, of bad deals or broken promises, or you say one thing and do another, that I think unless you just continue to talk in, in this way, uh, bo both publicly and also, you know, one on one, right. I just think you may lose people and lose progress. Jeff laid out a very ambitious timetable that's been in terms of an initial report, in terms of working out a plan, in terms of actually starting to build some sort of facility. Mm -hmm. um, and do you think that that's possible that within, I don't know, two to two and a half years we actually could have a facility open? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the key is that the, the first step is that we have uh, uh, experts in the city and the county in one room just laying it out, and then we see where it goes. And again, the, that's not the politicians all negotiating. It's the real experts, including the sheriff, uh, seeing what can work. And obviously, the, the sooner, uh, the most cost-effective we can do it, the better. Uh, at the same time, though, and this is this broader ap approach we've been laying out, I don't want to make mistakes by being in such a rush. This is, this is, if we do this right. Which was your position back on the amendment question during the campaign. Right. I mean, we've got to get, when we talk about jails, we actually have to talk about jails and the broader criminal justice system, how we do probation, how we do broader uh, treatment or reentry. It's all tied together. In, in many ways, the jail is the most expensive way to deal with a lot of the problems that we see, you know, law enforcement problems, drug treatment problems. And I think we also, while we're in a rush to deal with the jail space crunch, which we, should, you know, we need to solve, we also need, and I think the citizens want to see us dealing with the broader questions of how the whole system operates. We and know. that's important as well. And we have, we have one chance to get it right. And if we rush and only do one thing, we're going to be living with that solution for a long time. You know, back when the amendment was first floated and before it was on the ballot, uh, Pat DeWine, who's still on the commission, was on this show as a guest and talked about all those other sorts of things that could be right. approached, and then right. that got laid aside. But I think he's a potential, he's somebody who's really done some Absolutely. research about this. Pat, Pat deserves a lot of credit, um, and he, when we agreed to this Criminal Justice Commission earlier this week, it was a unanimous vote and because it came out of a lot of what Pat did uh, last year to try and broaden the conversation. And let's talk about that, this Criminal Justice Commission that's mm -hmm. been proposed. What is that and what are you trying to do? It's a way, you know, what happened last year is out of the blue, you know, the 11th hour of last year, we needed a jail. And I think the citizens thought, well, you know, that's sort of out of the blue. What's, what's the bigger picture? What's it all look like? And this will be a permanent way to solve that we will have, again, cross, you know, jurisdiction cooperation, the sheriff, the police chief, officials from Cincinnati and, and non-Cincinnati jurisdictions, county officials, all at one table on a regular basis discussing the broader correction system, the broader criminal justice system, not just jail space, but, you know, the, are we doing probation the best way possible to, to be both safe and cost effective? So the people who run the probation department will be at that the table? Ju the judges will be represented and they run The probation. judges will be represented. Right. And, and, okay. and, and then you'll have working groups with all these, but it's a way to so the public knows and so that we all know that as we make decisions on jail space or treatment that we're doing it thoughtfully, deliberatively and, and based on real assessment and analysis. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people have seen that to date. I think people know that we have a crime problem mm -hmm. and that we need to change, but they haven't seen the solutions come forward in a way that looked like they were really thought through. And this, I hope, will change that. It, it, it will also get us all on the same page so you don't have the problem in the past where you got you know one one official over here another official over here proposing things that are you know in conflict as i've read about this and i've talked to some people about this 
a number of folks have pointed out that it's important that this is an ongoing commission and not just a very temporary task force. Right. It, am I right about that? That's, that what that's it is. really what you're trying this to do. This is here? the goal is for it to be permanent. Um, it, it, this is, and it should be always going on. This kind of internal assessment: Are we following the best practices in the country? Are we measuring results? And we spend millions and millions of dollars on treatment and reentry programs, and we still have a 70 percent recidivism rate. And we should have a body looking into why aren't we doing better? What should we be doing better? Always, it's there's so much money wrapped up in our efforts to be a safe community, and I think we can look at the results of the last couple of years. The results aren't where they need to be. So we should be demanding more just from a accountability of the taxpayer standpoint. There's so much money going to this that we need to have per, you know, permanent oversight of how it's being done. And if we do it right, we'll be both safer, but I also think uh, we can also save a lot of money in the process. I only have about 30 seconds left, mm -hmm. but you know, there's the campaign mode of crime and we gotta solve it. Right. Does it look any different to you right now than it did six months ago? Um, not really. I mean, I've, I've for years, you know, from my own experience, personal experience with crime yes. to being a, at the city council, uh, cr crime in this community, as I said in my opening uh, swearing in, is, is just too high and we need to solve it. We need to it, be smart about solving it. It, it takes is tough still enforcement. the priority issue. Yes, it takes tough enforcement, but it also takes, you know, some smart work as well. And we have to do yeah. all of it and we have to do it quickly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Um, keep working. Thanks. Good <laughs> Stay to see tuned. you. Will do. It may seem hard to believe, but slavery exists today. After the break, an international expert will discuss the basic questions, why, who, where, and how. When Americans hear the word slavery, they normally think in terms of an American system that was ended 140 plus years ago. But a challenging new temporary exhibit at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center entitled Invisible Slavery documents a largely hidden but shocking story of slavery in our own time. Welcome back. Last Thursday evening, the Freedom Center hosted a presentation by the author of a book entitled Disposable People, New Slavery in a Global Economy. I am joined this morning by Kevin Bales, the president of Free the Slaves, a Washington-based non-governmental organization which has as its mission the goal of ending slavery worldwide. Kevin, welcome to Newsmakers. Great to be here. Welcome to Cincinnati. And Thanks. actually, you and I were talking just before, this really isn't Washington-based. This is much larger, your organization, right? Well, our, our organization is the American sister organization or branch of the world's oldest and, in fact, first human rights organization. So what's now called Anti-Slavery International in, in London is, in fact, the very first organization ever formed in slavery in 1787, and we've been operating continuously since then. Formed in 1787, and in 1807, 200 years ago this year... We had our first big success. Which was? the abolition of the slave trade, not slavery itself, but the slave trade in the British Empire. Which was a major breakthrough. And I guess probably most people would think that in combination with the end of slavery in the United States with the American Revolution, or pardon me, the Civil War, um, gee, slavery must be over. It's not in the 21st century? Well, legal slavery is over. And in fact, legal slavery ended, uh, yes, in the United States in 1865, in Brazil in 1888, uh, but not in Saudi Arabia or Nepal until the 1920s, 30s, even the 1950s and 60s. But, you know, you can make something illegal and it doesn't mean it disappears from the world. I mean, otherwise we would live in a world with no crime. Right. And uh, the fact is that uh, slavery has continued throughout all of human history up to the present moment. But the big change, one of the big changes, is the fact that there's been something of an explosion in illegal slavery, invisible slavery, over the last 50 years. So you're saying it's growing rather than shrinking? Our best estimate, our best conservative estimate, is that there are about 27 million people in slavery today. And that's twice the number that were taken out of Africa in the entire 350 years of the African slave trade. Now, when, let's get clear what we're talking about. When you're talking about slavery, are you talking about 
human beings who are owned by human beings, or are we talking about human beings that are just being exploited economically uh, because of low wages and something? Are we talking about ownership of people? We're talking about real slavery. Now, it isn't necessarily ownership in the sense that to be owned, it has to be legal. Le ownership is, in fact, a legal status, but it's about the complete control of a human being. In other words, it's everything that you would have with ownership without actually having that bill of sale. Give me some examples of where this operates and some examples, some statistics about how many people we're talking about in various situations. Well, it actually occurs in virtually every country in the entire world. In the United States, we probably have something like 50,000 people in slavery and another 17,000, according to the U.S. government, are being brought into the United States each year to be enslaved. Um, in the, uh, let's, let's stay with the U.S. for a moment. Okay. In the U.S., just under half of those people who are brought into the United States and enslaved here are, are women who are caught up in prostitution. They're not uh, doing this by choice. They're actually brought here often with the promise of a job as, say, a waitress. Then they're put into a situation where they're under total violent control of another person. They're paid nothing. And they're, when you say brought here, brought here from what? What's the range of countries? Well, there are, there are more than 50 countries represented in the slaves in the United States today. Mexico, China are the ones that have the largest number at the moment, uh, but there are also very large numbers from Eastern European countries, for example. What about in other parts of the world? Are there places that um, this is also operating illegally, but close to the surface? It's illegal in every country, but it's very close to the, to the surface in some of the poorest countries. So uh, there, we're not talking about situations of human trafficking. We're talking about situations of slavery that have been going on for generations. So, for example, in northern India, there's a form of slavery called debt bondage. And it, it sounds like somebody has a mortgage. It's not like our credit card payments at all. These are families that four or five generations ago took out a loan to cover a family emergency, an illness or a wedding or something like that. The loan is then passed down through the generations. And the, the, the crucial thing is that the, the family and all the work they do doesn't repay the loan. It's actually held as collateral for the loan by the person who, who owns them. So I've met families in their fourth and fifth generation of slavery in northern India where something in the entire country of India, something like eight to 10 million people are caught in that kind of sedentary, often agricultural slavery. When organizations like yours or others, and you collaborate with organizations sure. all over the world, it's not just your organization, and if you go to the website, and I'll be giving people the website and how to find it in a little bit here. Um, when governments are approached, whether it's the United States government, it's the Indian government, it's the Chinese government, and these sorts of things are pointed out, what kind of response are you getting? We get some really good words, but not a lot of action. Um, the U.S. government has a great line on, can, on the slavery in the United States today, and they talk a great line. But in terms of the resources necessary to solve the problem, it's not happening. And you can really see this if, you, if, if we look to the fact that the, the total number of people murdered in the United States each year is about 17,000. We also know that the total number of people brought in and enslaved in the United States each year is about 17,000. But more than 80% of all murders are solved in the United States. Less than 1% of all the slavery cases are solved each year. Solved in the sense of that person being rescued and freed. Yes, or at least even, yeah, rescued and freed and someone found responsible, but particularly just rescued and freed. So less than 1%. Wow. Um, you know, I think, uh, a qu go ahead. Well, I, imagine if those numbers were reversed and all of a sudden you picked up Time Magazine and it said, Big breakthrough, 17,000 murders last year. We've solved about 170 of them. Yeah. In this town, that <laughs> sort of concern is very high I'm about sure. rising murder rates yeah. and all that. I, I, this is an awkward question, but you know, we're talking about ownership or control. You know, control. Is there something about the cost of a slave? What does it, what's the cost? To yeah, oh, absolutely. get a slave or own in, a slave? In fact, if there's, if there's new news about slavery, it's all about the price of slaves. There's been a catastrophic collapse in the price of slaves in the last 50 years. It's linked in part to the population explosion and the fact that there's a glut of potential slaves on the world market. 
But if we were going to go back to Mississippi in 1850 and buy an average agricultural slave, the cost in 1850 was about $1,000, 1850 dollars. Right. In today's money, that's $40,000. Slaves were a big investment. We were recently in the Ivory Coast, in the west coast of Africa. We were able to send a uh, reporter with a hidden camera into a market who purchased for us two 19-year-old agricultural workers, equivalents of those Mississippi agricultural plantation slaves, for $40 each. $40. Now that's not unusual. Around the world today, the average price of a slave is around $90 to $100. And when you think about buying a whole human being and all their productive capacity for as little as $100, you can see that, for one thing, it turns them into not capital purchase items like buying a house or a tractor, but more like the plastic pen that we all write with. They become disposable. And if they become disposable, you know, if something's very expensive, the interest is in keeping that, in this Take case, a person, it. taking care of it, keeping that person alive. And that's one of the things that, in the study of American history, we, we know that American slavery, that um, was a little different than in certain other places, Brazil and certain other yes. places. Uh, slaves were expensive enough that they were kept alive and they propagated and there's all sorts of things there. What happens if you're, not, if you're only paying $40 or $50 what happens to these people if they're not useful anymore? Well, that's, that's one of the saddest parts about it, obviously, is that uh, it, there's, there's no incentive to give people that have been enslaved medical care, to treat, them, treat their injuries in any way. And, uh, you know, very sadly, I, I've seen young, young women in, in the sense of like 16, 17-year-olds who have been enslaved in prostitution in the Far East, who once they say, con you know, for one thing, they, they're not protected from HIV, and when they contract HIV, they're simply thrown under the street. Uh, and from that point, they might make it home to die or they might make it in treatment, but they're, they're just, they're simply disposable. Obviously, a question is, what, what does a person in Cincinnati, Ohio, an ordinary person, what can they do? Uh, what can be a response to this? I mean, one is knowledge and trying to learn about it, visiting the exhibit, uh, reading your book, uh, all those things, I'll, I'll let people know how to do that. But what do you do? And a person who was able to attend your uh, lecture on Thursday night called me after that lecture and said, please have him tell the story of the student at the University of Tennessee. I don't know where this is going, but will you tell that? <laughs> well, you know, we, we, you read books like this and you, and, you, and you see, say, some of our films and so forth, and you see people rescuing people from slavery. And you're your inclination is, I want to go do that. I want to, you know, I want to kick down a door in northern India. I want to grab a slave child who's being used to weave carpets. And I want to run out with them on my back and punch the slave holder in the nose on the way out and so forth. But the reality is that, what, that, that, that it doesn't work to fly a bunch of Americans off to a foreign country and get them to do stuff that, that they're really not equipped to do and they don't speak the languages. There was a, a student at the University of Tennessee who asked her professor, what is the best thing an individual can do? And she's, the, the professor saw it as a teachable moment and said, why don't you do that as your semester-long research project and study every possible thing a person can do and determine an, a measure of effectiveness? What's the most effective thing that a person, say an average college student, could do to, to bring slavery to an end around the world? Well, at the end of it all, and she looked at every possible, volunteering, pizza parties, you name it, she came back and said, I know it's a little mundane, but the absolute highest score in effectiveness is to take $10 a month and send it to an anti-slavery organization because they need the stability of funding necessary to support the workers in the developing world where most slaves are who actually go out and get people out of slavery. And she was particularly using some of the figures from our own work, uh, again in India, where whole families come out of slavery for about $40 is what it costs us to run those programs. That's not buying them out. That's just paying for the office space and the phone and, and, the, and the workers' salaries that go out and work with, with people in debt bondage slavery. And about $40 over is what it takes to bring a whole family out. Wow. Thank you very much. Let me tell people about some things here that they can do. Certainly. If you would like to learn more about this topic, there are three possibilities that are easy. The Freedom Center exhibit, Invisible Slavery Today remains open through February 28th. 
The website for Kevin Bale's organization is www.freetheslaves.net. And third, you can get Mr. Bale's book, Disposable People. Kevin, thank you very much for being here, and uh, good luck with your work, and thanks for working with the Freedom Center on this sort of thing. It's been great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. If you want to go back and re-listen to an interview, or if you miss a show, all Newsmakers programs will now be streamed onto our website, local12.com. Join us again next week to meet the women and the men working to shape our region, and in Mr. Bale's case, uh, the world, and have a good week. Thank you.